everyone hi welcome to a monthly wrap up what am i wrapping up september if you're confused by the new background i'm in the u.s i'm visiting my parents uh they live in i'm originally from san diego but they recently moved to pennsylvania really feeling the autumn very excited and actually i'm going to be filming um a video that's kind of more bookish um i have a book haul i don't do book hauls but like i need to do one it's very small but like i need to do one for this trip because i bought very important things so just please hold off next week probably um i am very excited to share a autumn themed bookish video with you but speaking of loving autumn and being so excited for it i'm so excited to talk about the sponsor of this video and that is thread up i have loved thread up since before i had youtube um so the fact that i get to talk about them right now and work with them is very exciting thread up is an online consignment store so you can buy clothes secondhand um what i'm currently wearing this cozy little sweater uh which is where is it from? Oh, this is from Guess. It's just a wonderful and very dangerous store for my wallet. I love buying clothes secondhand and ThreadUp makes it really easy to search whether you have a specific brand that you're looking for. You're able to sort so that you only see things in the sizes that you choose, the colors that you choose. In a moment, I'm going to show you my haul because I scored with a lot of my like fall transitional items. So I'll show you that in a second. But um, if you want, there is a link in the description box. You can actually look at everything that I bought and and then ThreadUp's amazing and kind of gives you like similar options on the site as well. So you can check out all of that and then you can use my code CARRY to get 40% off. Normally it's a 30% off code, but now I got you a 40% off deal. Absolutely wonderful. If you're looking for things like winter coats that can be so expensive and you want to have a secondhand option, um, I, I really, I love ThreadUp. So here's a quick look at what I got. <laughs> So once again, you can use my code CARRY for 40% off of your first purchase. Highly recommend. Thank you so much to ThreadUp. I'm actually incredibly lucky that I ordered because I thought it was going to be a lot warmer and it is, but the first two days that we're here, hence why it's kind of cold and gloomy, the light on me, it's chilly and I didn't bring any proper sweaters. So thank you, ThreadUp. <laughs> keeping me warm. But let's talk about what I read in September. It was an interesting month, I've got to say. I'm just going to dive in. Are you prepared? Here we go. First thing I read was actually the Summer I Turned Pretty trilogy. I'm not going to talk about it. I made a reading vlog about it and if you want to know about the Summer I Turned Pretty, you can watch the videos, but basically they are not worth talking about. Skipping over that, going straight into the darkest, yes, the darkest part of the forest. This is by Holly Black, who you would know from The Cruel Prince, The Stolen Heir. She writes excellent fairy tales. She knows her fairy shit. She has fairy ears. She got them cut so that she actually is a fairy herself. I always love the imagery and, and like the worlds that she creates. So this was actually recommended to me by my friend Perry. How should I talk about this book? It takes place in the human world in this small town that is famous because it has a fairy prince sleeping in a crystal or glass coffin in the middle of the woods outside of town and he's been there for years like generations and nobody can open the coffin they throw parties around the clearing in the woods like he's just a part of town you know and we follow this brother and sister who kind of have an obsession with him and one day he goes missing the coffin is open and empty and we kind of go on this adventure um it wasn't as i guess 
delicious as The Cruel Prince or even The Stolen Heir. It's a standalone and it felt very... Mm, I guess I just didn't sink into it as much. I don't know really how to explain it. And somebody commented, I posted that I started to read it and I was only on chapter five and somebody commented on Instagram like, this is a smooch fest. And I was kind of like, this is a what? And sure enough, there is so much talk. This is not like a smutty book at all, but there is so much talk about kissing. Like every chapter we have to talk about kissing and like it's very important somehow it's it's really weird so as i was reading it i had that comment in my head like smooch fest smooch fest <laughs> and it is so again it's not like a smutty book whatsoever but there's it's like if you like fairy princes and forests and kissing there it is again i liked the imagery it was a little it was different because it was unlike her other books very much taking place in the human realm so it was very like small town high school parties and stuff like that so quite different but i still liked it and i do think it really fits a fall atmosphere even though i believe it's supposed to be taking place a little bit over summer but yeah i think if you like holly black you would like this that's the darkest part of the forest after that, oh my god, I read Giovanni's Room. This has been on my radar for a while, but it's one of those things where, I don't know, I get really intimidated by certain writers and James Baldwin is one that I was like, I need to be at a point where I can like focus on it. And this is not an intimidating book at all. Um, it was just so beautiful and sad. I underlined so many lines. It follows a man who is living in Paris, going through a kind of just tumultuous time in his life. He's American. He has like this strange group of friends um, that he doesn't seem to like at all. And then he meets another man named Giovanni and they start this relationship. I can't even go into it that much more. I posted, if you look on my Instagram, I posted quite a few of the lines um, that I highlighted and it was, it was really, it's short, but it's so beautiful. And again, if you ever feel intimidated by authors and, and poets and things like that that are very celebrated and, and seem like it would take a kind of big brain to read them, this was so accessible and beautiful and um, I highly recommend and beautiful on so many different levels like if you love Paris if you love city life it's beautiful because of how Paris is talked about but if you love love and relationships and talking about discovering yourself and stuff like that there, there was just mm, so much in there but very sad um Giovanni's room <laughs> Okay, the next book I read, I don't remember reading. Thank God I took notes. I do, I do remember it now, but if, yeah. Um, this was Hello Stranger. Um, I kind of didn't know where to go after reading Giovanni's Room. I was like, what on earth do I read next? And so I happen to have a physical copy of Hello Stranger on me. And this is a romance. Based on the synopsis, I kind of knew like, this is gonna be probably a miss for me. But here are my notes. I put lots of dramatic irony. We knew from the get-go what's going on, but not in a super funny way. And all the characters just seemed dumb as hell and totally unbelievable, but it was fine to read, lol. <laughs> this book is about an artist who specializes in portraits and she just entered a contest um, that is going to change her life, put her on the map if she wins this. And she's been a struggling artist for forever and that's kind of like, she has a big chip on her shoulder because of this and so this is like a life changing moment. She gets in a little accident which causes her to have facial blindness. So when she looks, and this is a real thing, um, but when she looks at a face, she can't, her mind doesn't make sense of it. She's like, well, I can see that you have eyes and a nose and a mouth, but I can't, I wouldn't be able to recognize you. Like I can't remember this collection of features and be like, oh, that's my mom. Or like, oh, that's my boyfriend, right? She needs to draw a portrait, but she cannot see faces. She has the hots for her veterinarian. She has this totally evil neighbor. It's just, it's it's a lot. But again, it it was supposed to be this dramatic irony, right? Because we know, even though we're reading the book and we can't see their faces either, I feel like we as readers knew who each person was, even though she couldn't tell because of their faces. And so there was a lot of dramatic irony, but it just, instead of it being 
interesting and you were like excited for her to finally put the puzzle together it just made her seem so dumb and like even her friends felt really stupid like it the characters just felt extremely dumb and if we just kind of spoke lit it was it readable yeah sure absolutely i read it in kind of one sitting as one does with romance books sometimes so it was super readable but it wasn't it was more like frustrating than anything else if that sounded interesting it was a book that i read and it passed the time hello stranger <laughs> after that i believe i saw jack aka jack edwards read this and i picked it up and it was available at my library i read the hero of this book it was a very short read and it's a memoir and the author's mother had passed away about 10 months ago and she's in london and she's just kind of reminiscing on her mother and herself and what i think made me connect most to this book it's written in a very i really i just liked the writing it was very easy to consume i like ate it up what was so great was that the route that she's taking we're going on a walk with her in london as she's like sorting through her thoughts where she stayed her hotel must have been like the same hotel that i stayed at when i was in london last month as she's going for a walk and she's telling us where she's going that's the exact route that i walked when i had like a little time before i caught my flight so it was just really weird that i could see it so clearly because i was just there but then she also just had some things where she was talking about like she was in the tape and there was a guy on his phone and she just had this overcoming emotion to like kill him and i was like i've yeah yeah i've been there so it just there were these little moments that were really relatable. I don't think as a whole it was like the most beautiful memoir I've ever read, but there were just so many points in it where I felt very seen. Um, and like I said, it was written in a really simple and engaging way. It's kind of meta because she was talking about people who write memoirs and stuff like that. Her mom was just a complicated woman and kind of unraveling that and stuff. Um, I recommend if you're looking for a quick read, the hero of this book. Oh my god, getting into this. Also, I'm sorry about the lighting. It is so dark outside. A very blustery autumn day, but it makes for some interesting light going on in here. Diving into these, I... How do I even go about this? So I think it was last year. I read Gilded by Marissa Meyer, who... Marissa Meyer is a usual hit when it comes to hit or miss. She's usually a hit for me. She's the queen of retelling. So she's done, she had the Lunar Chronicles, which I love and I highly recommend, which has a modern twist on Cinderella, Rapunzel, Little Red Riding Hood, all of these different characters. Um, she did a Alice in Wonderland retelling that broke me. She's done many retellings, let's just say. And so I was excited to read her book Gilded, which is, a Rumpelstiltskin retelling, which just intrigued the hell out of me. I was like, how, how are we doing a Rumpelstiltskin retelling? And when I read Gilded the first time, it's a duology, when I read Gilded the first time, I didn't like it. It was very slow. I felt like there was so much time that we spent that kind of didn't play into the actual plot. Overall, I just, I just thought it was very strange um i thought the idea was interesting but i just mm. but i decided once again in the beginning of this month i just kind of didn't know what to read and so i was kind of bumbling around and i was like you know what the second book of that duology came out let's read it let's finish this because i love finishing a story and so i read gilded again and then i read cursed so for more information Gilded is about a girl who is cursed slash blessed by the god of storytelling and so she can't help it anytime anyone asks her like a super mundane question like hey what'd you have for lunch she lies or she embellishes and each time she embellishes it gets more ridiculous and in this world it is known that there is a veil and there is the fairy world and so every full moon the fairy hunt comes comes through town and everyone knows to like lock their doors and just sleep because they will take away anybody that's still awake blah 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 so in the beginning of our story she runs into some trouble where she is awake and she runs into the hunt and they ask her some questions and she just makes these bizarre claims she just starts talking and she kind of can't stop and she accidentally 
lies about the fact that she can make straw into gold, which is the Rumpelstiltskin part. So then she, of course, gets taken and is forced to prove her talent. And the story goes on from there. Upon my second read, I actually liked it more. I felt like the pacing was somehow better, maybe because I knew how it was going to end. It still wasn't my absolute favorite, but I did feel like it moved a lot quicker. There's a lot of nice imagery in there. There's like a haunted castle in the middle of a lake and lots of moonlight. And I really liked the side characters. So I'm glad that I read it again, um, but Cursed was weird as hell. This could be potentially spoilery. I think if you know the Rumpelstiltskin, like what's the two things we know about the Rumpelstiltskin story? He can spin straw into gold and what else? There's one other thing two things but one other thing so if you want to skip i'm not going to spoil the whole thing but like feel free to skip to this part if you don't want to hear about cursed out you go so with cursed as we know with rumpelstiltskin we promise rumpelstiltskin our firstborn child right unless you can guess his name so in gilded our girl does get help from this friendly ghost and they end up having a relationship that ends with at the very end we realize that she is pregnant with his child so as you guys know i'm not a big fan of like surprise pregnancies in books and cursed centers around this pregnancy and weirder still is that there's a whole thing i don't want to get too far into it but basically she becomes a ghost a little bit and somehow is like ripped from her physical body so the entire book we know she's pregnant but she's physically isn't her like actual uncursed body is like put in a shed where the baby is just like growing by itself in her body and she's just like a normal not pregnant girl running around having this adventure but we also know in the back of our minds that like there's a sleeping body carrying a baby for nine months like it's it was so bizarre i just couldn't get over it and i almost was like why couldn't you just just have her be normally pregnant and running around doing things like it was just so bizarre that I couldn't sink into the story so I actually ended up not loving it because of that I do think that the story was really interesting in terms of like jumping from either side of the veil talking about all these different kinds of fairies the curse it was good but that part of like she's this teenage girl who is pregnant but not pregnant and her ghostly uh, it was just it was so bizarre if you feel like that's interesting to you go for it i didn't hate it but it was just like i couldn't i couldn't focus on the story anyway that was gilded and cursed it was a uh it was an adventure that i went on and i'm excited for more of her work but i would like no one else to ever write a rubble stiltskin retelling because i feel like there's no good way to do it and i'm disturbed <laughs> so Gilded and Cursed, Marissa Meyer. <laughs> After that, I actually forgot I read this earlier in the month. I read Heart of the Raven Prince. This is on Kindle Unlimited and it's part of a series that is also fairy tale retellings. I read the first one in the series maybe last year and it was a retelling. I think it was Beauty and the Beast um, and I didn't I didn't love it but I've heard that like within the series there are very different ratings so I think a lot of people liked Heart of the Raven Prince um so I gave it a try and I didn't mind it actually what are my notes I put Cinderella retelling everyone was in on it there oh cool thank you past Carrie so yeah it's a Cinderella retelling it is it is oh it is okay 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 I'm, okay I'm here I'm here so we follow a girl who is very Cinderella-esque she has an evil stepmother evil stepsisters and because she has friends in high places because she used to be like her father used to be important whatever um one of her friends invites her to this ball which is where you know they're all all the bachelorettes are gonna try and win the heart of the raven prince right and she has to go so her step family can't be like you can't come the invitation only works if they also bring along 
Cinderella, right? There is a huge mix-up, there is mistaken identity, and what I really liked about it, so just overall, like, that's kind of where we go. I don't really want to tell you too much more. The Raven Prince is being pressured by his sister to find a match so that he can then take the throne. There is a princess who is brought in to hopefully be courted by him, and she is basically like, fuck no, I do not want this. Then we have Cinderella running around trying to run away from her stepfamily who's trying to get her engaged to this creepy monk man so that they can have like a position in court mm, it's just like a kind of a mess but what I really liked is there is this kind of deception trope like Cinderella is trying to pass herself off as somebody else so that she can run away from her family and what I liked about it is that everybody's in on it immediately so we don't have this like Cinderella is lying to the prince the whole time they're in cahoots and so I I really appreciated that part of it. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I thought it was good. I thought it was fine. It wasn't mind-blowing, but to pass the time, I would recommend if any of that sounds good to you. I think I liked the both of the main characters quite a bit. Yeah, it does, however, slightly spoil the first book, but I really didn't like the first book. It's the Beauty and the Beast retelling, so I don't think you're missing out on much. It's literally just, does Beauty and the Beast, do they get married in the end? What do you think? Um, so if you don't want that spoiled, uh, you can read the first book as well, but I don't think it was worth the time. Uh, so that was the heart of the Raven Prince. <laughs> Next up, oh my god, I finally read All Systems Red. This is part of a very famous series of novellas that are called the Murderbot. I don't know if it's the Murderbot Diaries, the Murderbot. I'll put it up here. These are very famous science fiction novellas. I had no idea they were novellas, first of all. I was prepared to read hundreds of pages, and I believe this was only maybe 100 pages. This is the first book, All Systems Red, so we kind of are introduced to the concept of Murderbots and the world. It was really good. It follows a kind of and Android, like there are organic parts to them but they are also mostly machine and they were built to be murder bots they are now currently used as like security detail and stuff like that they can be rented out and this particular murder bot is assigned to a research team where we're in this future world and people can invest in and purchase parts of planets and you're not going to buy a house sight unseen or buy a planet sight unseen so they send research crews to check out the planet and they bring a murder bot along to like be security and help you know whatever so we follow this particular murder bot on this particular research mission they have broken out of their government programming so they are free thinking they're very funny and they just want to sit around and binge crappy tv shows all the time and they have feelings and they are self-conscious and they are just, I, I thought it was really great. And the ending kind of took me by surprise. And so I am excited to continue the series. Um, I would highly recommend it if you are kind of interested in getting more into sci-fi. Um, it felt not quite as funny, but the the kind of dark, ridiculous humor of Gideon the Ninth. I could see, I could see Gideon in this world. It was funnier than I expected, and it was it was just short, and it got to the point, and it built the world, and we went on this adventure, and. I really liked it, so I'm very excited to continue. That is all systems red. After that, very excited to announce a hold came in. I was waiting. I think this was like a 10 week wait. Um, I finally got Greenwood. For some reason, I thought this came out recently. It did not, um, so I don't know how I heard about it, but here it is, Greenwood. This is a book about trees. This is a book for tree lovers, immediately putting that out there. Um, this is a multi-generational story and it's told in a similar way to like the cloud atlas. It's supposed to be similar to tree rings, how, you know, a tree grows and we get all of these rings coming outward. The way the story is told is we see present day, past generation, past generation, past generation, and then we go back until present day. I really, really loved the first point of view that is present day, slight, I mean, it's actually slightly future. It's in a world where there has been this epidemic um, just killing so many trees all over the world. And because of that, then we have all these dust storms and only the very rich can live in places where they are not 
constantly breathing in dust and we follow a girl who works in this one tree sanctuary and i just thought i loved the first i i I loved it. I was like, oh my god, this is gonna be my favorite book of the year. I was so excited for the first POV. And then I kind of liked the second POV. And then I just continuously lost interest. And so by the time that we built ourselves back up, coming back into the first POV, I was just kind of done with it. I think it was, for me, a little bit too long. We go all the way back, I believe, to the Great Depression. We're trying to figure out our main girl's lineage, who is her father where does she come from kind of thing and it was yeah i i really wanted to like it i loved the first probably 50 maybe even 100 pages and then i just wasn't super into it anymore i would still recommend that you give it a try though but that was greenwood a little disappointed based on just how strongly it started off but if you love trees give it a try after that, I'm not going to go too much into it because I made a whole video about it, but I finally read The Raven Cycle, uh, The Raven Boys, Dream Thieves, Blue Lily, Lily Blue, woo, and um, The Raven King. I had read The Raven Boys a couple years ago, and for some reason I didn't connect with it at all, and then I decided, no, something is clearly wrong with me. I'm going to give it another try, and yeah, something was clearly wrong with me. I, I really liked it. I understand why people are so taken with this series. Um, it's very character based. The plot is not so important, I would say, but we follow a girl who comes from a family of clairvoyance. Part of their job is every year they go to this church where they see all of the souls of the people who are going to die in the next 12 months parade by and they kind of take notes and like let people know to like get ready kind of thing. She normally can't see them. She actually doesn't have clairvoyant powers, but for some reason this year she sees a boy and he tells her his name and she realizes that he goes to the school next to her and she's obviously shaken by this and she wants to get to know him and, and let him know that like, hey buddy, next 12 months, you know? Because of this, she ends up getting wrapped up in this quest that involves Welsh kings, ravens, rich boys, not rich boys, Camaros. It was just, it was really great. So if you love stories that are much more about characters and relationships than it is necessarily about the actual overarching plot, it was really great. It just had a really interesting atmosphere to it. Um, at first I really hated one of the characters and then luckily certain books I felt like focused more on a different character and so because of that and I got to understand the character that I hated I ended up really loving him and so I felt like the author really really loved these characters that she created and because of that they felt lifelike um and I yeah I just I really recommend it I I will say that I thought the ending like we built it up so much for like certain things to happen in the plot and then when they actually do happen it was very fast and kind of like oh okay <laughs> so i think there there were definitely some things that i didn't love but overall just the experience of reading that whole series i loved it and so thank you to everybody who pressured me <laughs> peer pressured me into reading them again the raven cycle Ooh, next up after that, I read Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. This is a retelling of Anthony and Cleopatra, and it takes place in this futuristic, but kind of not futuristic, Hong Kong, specifically Kowloon. And so the world itself, I really loved. I really enjoyed. Um, it was just like this crowded, busy, kind of claustrophobic city. I also really liked the fantasy element of this much more than what was going on in These Violent Delights. Um, that was her first book and it was a Romeo and Juliet retelling. And what bothered me about that is there is a fantasy element, but it felt so removed from the plot and a little bit weird, if you know what I'm talking about. So I didn't love that, but the way that she incorporates fantasy into this one is much more seamless and makes a lot of sense and is such a, an integral part of the plot that I liked it so much more. So this is about a kingdom that has, within the past decade, had a lot of changes, mainly because the royal family, there are like two kingdoms, the royal family of Kingdom A got beheaded, all of them. By who? By the princess, by their daughter. So 
the princess has since disappeared and kingdom A and B have now just kind of become one. Um, and there's obviously a lot of unrest issues with that. I don't want to go too far into it, but in our story we follow Kala, who is the princess that beheaded her family, and she's been in hiding for many years, five, eight years, um, just biding her time until she was put into this game that the kingdom has, which is they basically have, instead of just like a lottery, where you buy a ticket and if your number is called, you win money. No, no, that wouldn't be fun. Instead, they have like a death match where you put your name in, they pull 88 different players, and then you play. There's not even like an arena. It's just like in the town, in the city, you can walk around and kill anybody who's in the game until you are the only one left standing and then you win money. Okay, she enters in this because if you win, you get to meet the king and the king is her uncle and she would really like to finish off her job of beheading all of her family. So, you see where this is going? Um, we meet various other characters and the fantasy element is that there is body jumping. So everybody has chi, which is their soul, their energy, and you can jump into another body and if your chi is stronger than theirs you can take over their body or you might find an empty body. I wish she had gone into the actual morality of that because it's really glazed over. You can just jump into someone else's body like I feel like that's a little invasive and it's never really talked about. There was a time where somebody jumps into like a 12 year old girl's body so that they can deliver a message hidden and like then they jump out of her and she's standing in a dangerous neighborhood like oh my god what happened where am i like what like can we talk about i don't know the etiquette of <laughs> of stealing someone's body um so that's one thing that i was kind of like i hope she goes into that maybe more or maybe that's not the point like maybe in this world that's just a thing that happens i don't know but that was kind of bizarre. Um, and also just with Chloe's writing, I said this with these Violent Delights as well, she creates these really beautiful scenes, these really beautiful worlds. Like I said, I felt like I was in the city, but the scenes that I feel like are supposed to be really important happen so fast. There are just things that I feel like should have been given more time for us to like experience the moment, but instead she writes it like, this happened. Next, I think that I like the book more having read it and now thinking back on it and like telling the story to myself because I'm able to like pace it myself. Um, the actual reading experience I didn't love, um, but I am excited to continue it. I thought it was a duology. It's a trilogy, uh, so very, very unfinished, but um, this is one that I am excited to continue, I think. So that is Immortal Longings. <laughs> After that, I was very honored to read an arc by a friend of mine. So full disclaimer, I am biased, but um, my friend Sarah Souk wrote a book called The Space Between Here and Now. It is a young adult, I would say borderline middle grade, like an advanced middle grade to a young, young adult. Um, sci-fi about time travel and memory and self-discovery and it took a turn that I wasn't expecting and I think made it so a much stronger story. We follow a girl who has something called what sensory time warp syndrome which is uh she can be triggered by something. For her, it is a smell. And if she smells something that triggers a memory, she will be pulled back in time into that memory. And she can't change time. She doesn't actually travel in time, but she is sucked into this memory where she's just a ghost and has to like watch it happen. And it seems to be getting worse. It's obviously something that messes with her normal life. Um, and so she's struggling in daily life, but of course, her friends don't understand. Her dad wants to just pretend that it's not happening. And so she decides that she needs to take this into her own hands. And for her, that means finding her mother. So when she was, I think, six years old, her mother left and never came back. And she believes that that's really important um, to understanding her time warp 
the syndrome because a lot of her almost all of her memories that she goes back to are involving her mother so she decides to book a ticket to korea where her parents are from. She's gonna stay with her aunt and try to find any information about her mom. And we go on this adventure with her. Like I said, I don't wanna spoil it, but I think it took a turn that I have not seen. I, I would never expect a kind of middle grade young adult book to do. And I think it just made it a really strong ending, a really strong story. I really liked it. I think. I can think of so many people, so many kids who it would be important for them to read this. I really enjoyed it. I read it in about one sitting. It was very cute to read about Soul, and I think Sarah got it perfectly. Like the things that she wanted to do were the things that, you know, a newbie to Korea would want to do. So she went on these like little dates with herself or maybe with a cute boy. I don't know. But yeah, it was just, it was very adorable and, and very heartwarming and still very hard hitting. So that is the space between here and now. Next up, I don't know who I heard about this from, but thank you. I think I saw it on Bookstagram, whatever. I read Fair Rosaline, Rosalyn. Okay, I'm not, I always mess up how to pronounce that. Anyway, it is a, not a Romeo and Juliet retelling, but it is about what happened before. So if you know the story of Romeo and Juliet, Romeo was initially obsessed with Rosalind, who ended up being Juliet's cousin, and he was all set to marry her, like super obsessed, crazy boy. And then he sees Juliet and he's like, whoop, never mind. And we are told the story of Rosalind, and I thought it was really good. Um, it was absolutely a character assassination, and I was all here for it. I can't even explain that much more about it. It was just really good. It was kind of frustrating to read in the beginning because Rosalind is very naive and very young. Um, Juliet is 13 in Romeo and Juliet. Rosalind is similar. She's just this young girl who has never been allowed, you know, outside of her guardian's eyesight and she's just been coddled and when she sees this little bit of freedom, this little bit of rebellion, she goes all in. And so in the beginning she was a frustrating character to understand, but as you continue she grows and learns and you're really rooting for her you're rooting for everybody and i thought it was really great i thought the imagery was wonderful it's all you know verona italy in summer um and so just the descriptions of the food and the nature and everything overall 100 percent enjoyed what did my notes say oh yeah and i really connected with this whole idea of a romantic partner seeing you as what they want you to be instead of as who you are and as someone who has suffered with that where you're dating someone and they so obviously have this like dream like manic pixie dream girl version of you in their head that they like don't even see you or they like write off things that you do because it doesn't fit the narrative that they want. And so I was just immediately, I was like, girl, I'm on your side, kick him to the curb. Like it was, I, yeah, really enjoyed it. It was also really sad, I mean, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy, so you do know what's gonna happen to certain characters and you're just like, can we retell this retelling and change things? Overall, really good. Uh, a recent release, Fair Rosalind, Rosaline. <laughs> After that, very quickly, I read Four Treasures of the Sky. I attempted to read, I believe it's called Sour Heart, another one of her books, but I, I don't know why. I think I just didn't connect with that one, but I gave Four Treasures a try and I actually liked it a lot more. Full trigger warnings though, this is extremely dark, but we follow a girl who was born in China in the 1800s, um, but because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, before the full Chinese Exclusion Act, they started to forbid Chinese women from coming into the United States. And so there were people who would come to China and kidnap young women and bring them over, like sneak them into America and sell them into sex slavery, into brothels. Um, and this happens to her. And so we follow her story of her being taken to America, growing up in a brothel in San Francisco, constantly looking to escape. Um, and we follow her kind of life from there. I didn't love the length of this story. I really liked the beginning in terms of how descriptive the writing was. It got a little long. There was a, a, a significant part of the novel that I didn't really not connect with, but um, I felt like it could have been shortened a little bit. It was very, the beginning was very centered on our main girl. Um, and then I felt like we suddenly got 
two new characters introduced and we had a lot of time with them that I felt it just changed the pacing of the story to suddenly a lot slower but I still really enjoyed it I was very surprised by the ending and I would recommend it especially like growing up in California we learned the bare minimum I should know if of anyone from the United States Californians should know the most about the Chinese Exclusion Act and we barely touched on it in school so if you would like to read about that time period that I feel like we really brushed over even though we had a whole year of California history classes I would I would definitely check it out um but yeah it is dark it also ooh, that's one thing before she gets kidnapped she worked at like a calligraphy school and so there's so much talk about different Chinese characters and their meaning and I love that so if you're a sucker for like linguistics or anything to do with languages that was what kept me going through the whole book I was like teach me more this is so exciting um so again four treasures of the sky <laughs> Okay, very quickly, next up I read September House. This is a haunted house story. Somebody on Bookstagram, I think it's Lala maybe, is doing um, like a book club surrounding this. So I was like, ooh, I wanna check this out. It's a haunted house story. As we know, haunted houses are often used to represent abuse or being sheltered or being isolated. And so this story is absolutely about abuse and isolation. I thought that it was a really interesting concept. It's about a woman who her and her husband buy her dream house. They are so excited about this house and then they move in and it's haunted and especially in September it reaches its peak so like the walls start to bleed and there are like headless children walking around and stuff like that. We follow her in one particular September where her husband has gone missing and her daughter who is old and like graduated college working, hasn't been around, um, is suddenly like, where is dad? <laughs> and so the daughter is like, I'm coming home. I'm coming to see you guys and we're gonna track down. We're gonna go to the police. We're gonna find dad. And the mom has not told her that they live in a haunted house. So she like, tries to talk to the ghosts and be like hey can you guys like chill while my daughter's here and stuff like that and so she's trying to hide the fact that her house is haunted this book was frustrating because like i said i thought it was a really interesting concept but it was like just not enough like it was funny but it wasn't funny enough like i wouldn't call it a funny book there were some jokes but it was like i never chuckled i would read it and be like oh that was meant to be a funny line you know um so it wasn't quite scary enough it wasn't quite funny enough it wasn't quite i thought that the way that they were talking about abuse wasn't quite interesting or new enough i don't know i just wanted it to be like one level up but it was a quick haunted house story so if you're looking for one to read in the halloween season give it a try it also is in high demand like i had to wait quite a long time at my library and then my library actually bought a sh ton of copies there was extremely high demand for it so I don't know maybe i missed something let me know your thoughts if you read it but yeah i just felt like it just needed to be dialed up like uh, just a little bit more to be great um that was september house also i mean trigger warnings please look them up after that continuing with my autumn theme i finally read the truants this is a book that is on a lot of lists like when you look up dark academia books the truants will be on there but surprisingly, my library did not have a copy. And my library, it's rare for me to not find a book at my library, San Diego County Library, shout out to them. Incredible, incredible catalog. So the fact that the truants wasn't there, I was like, what? This is so mysterious. And it like made me want to read the book even more. So I purchased it and yeah, this is a dark academia story. It's certainly not the best, but I feel like if you do like those kind of stories oh my battery you should give it a try let me change my battery i'll be right back so the truants follows a group of students specifically one girl who has gone specifically to this college to study under a author professor she writes about writers um specifically she wrote a book called the truants which is about um this kind of generation of authors who broke the rules and changed the status quo and she believes that you need to live a kind of it's it's okay to live an immoral life as long as that produces art and so our main girl is interested in studying under her how do i explain the rest of this book it's basically about obsession 
and passion, what rules are okay to break and what happens when you do break these rules. I really liked the beginning of the book um, and then it took more than one turn where I was like, oh, okay, where is this going? So I didn't love how we got to the ending. I do think the ending was quite interesting, um, but like I said, it wasn't my favorite Dark Academia. I wouldn't even call it super academic because we very quickly leave any discussion of like literary study in the dust um, and it it's mainly a story about an obsession of these students with each other and these students with their teacher so yeah i do think it did capture like again if you are committed to enjoying dark academia i would give it a try but if you are like dipping your toes in a kind of dark academia genre i wouldn't there is murder and mystery and a lot of talk about Agatha Christie in it. Obviously with Dark Academia, lots of drugs, lots of sex. Um, the truants. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a, what a twist. Um, the last book that I read <laughs> was Icebreaker. I was on a 13 hour flight to come here. And as you guys know, I read romance on the airplanes. What do I have to say about this book? I have seen this book everywhere. Hockey romances, for better or for worse, I'm not gonna make any comments <laughs> about the hockey romance genre, um, but it's exploded. And um, I wanted to finally read one of these books. So I read Icebreaker and um, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. I think that it was way too long. This was a 480 page book according to my Kindle and it did not need to be that long. It's a story about college athletes. We have Anastasia who is an ice skater. She does uh, pair ice skating so her and her partner um, and then we have Nate who is the captain of the hockey team and this particular school has two ice rinks so normally they never ever see each other. Something happens to one of the rinks and so the hockey team and the ice skaters now need to share one rink and so they need to communicate about scheduling and practice and stuff like that and Nate and Anastasia are kind of forced into each other's worlds. I liked so many elements of this book. Like, first of all, I just thought it was funny. I really liked all the characters, actually. I will say that it's dual POV, and towards the end of the book, there were a couple times where I wasn't sure whose POV I was reading, because <laughs> Anastasia and Nate kind of become quite similar to me, but I do just think it was too long. There were a lot of scenes, especially like the smut scenes, too long, too many. There were certain scenes that were very much like, oh, this author has a fantasy that she wants to put on paper because it was like, I could have erased that entire scene and it wouldn't have changed a damn thing. I wish she had made, if you've read the book, there's a whole part that takes place over Christmas break. She could have made that a completely separate novella that I feel like people would have loved and that would have been a cute book to read over the holidays. But why were there like 200 pages of this Christmas break that at the end of the day didn't change anything? I mean, I didn't mind because I was on a 13 hour flight. So like, please give me all the content you want. But it was just sort of like, why is this here? I felt like I was reading this book for so long. I only read one book on my flight and normally I can read two, maybe even three books on like a 13 to 15 hour flight. So for me to only have read one book, <laughs> it was a long book. I will say, please read the trigger warnings beforehand. There is a lot of talk about calories and food restriction and dieting and weight, but I thought that it was talked about in a productive way. At first I was kind of concerned with how it was being talked about, but then as you continue on, it gets much better. I thought the ending was stupid. I think it was so silly. I mean, it fully, fully a fantasy. Um, the way that it ends, I mean, it's wholesome, it's cute, but I was just sort of like, Hannah, <laughs> really Hannah? <laughs> so yeah, I think, you know, it was fine. The smut scenes were like absolutely not my cup of tea, but at the same time I was like unbothered. It, it was very easy to skim. I was very confused by the UC system because they go, instead of like UCLA or UCSD, they go to UCMH, which is the University of California of Maple Hills. I was just like, why did this need to take place in LA? Like this could have taken place anywhere else. And instead, why would UC Maple Hills be right next to UCLA? Like they're literally next door to each other. They go clubbing in like WeHo. And I'm just sort of like, why was this place in LA? <laughs> so that kind of threw me for a loop. But overall, it was just like a fine, a fine romance. I'm here for it. So that was Icebreaker. And that was the final book.
that I read for September. It is September 30th, but I have just been home playing with my dog, um, so I haven't been reading much, but <sighs> that was my month. How weird. What a strange reading month that was. I felt like I was just, it was a month where I was just kind of grabbing any book that came into my orbit, and as a result, we have this weird list before you. But yeah, thank you as always for being here, um, and I'm very excited to share my next week's video. And yeah, as always, let me know what you guys were reading and I will see you guys next time. Once again, thank you to thread up. The information will be down below, but you can use my code Carrie to get 40% off of your first purchase. Really highly recommend them. They're a wonderful service that I love so much. So thank you thread up for supporting this channel. I will catch you guys later. All of my batteries are dying, so I need to wrap this up. I'll catch you then. Hope you're having a wonderful autumn or spring and, uh, See you when I see you, okay? Bye!